Chia is going to speak to us today about the communicative approach online and how you can motivate your students. She's a, she is a successful writer, she's an ELT expert, and it's such a pleasure to have you here with us today, Chia. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Federica. Thank you so much. And it's great to be back here again um, with Macmillan doing one of their webinars. Hello, everybody. My name is Chia Suan Chong, and I am, like you, working from home. And it's great that um, we are able to do such a thing that we, with the internet, like um, Federica said, and with the kind of jobs that we have, that we are actually able to do this, to work from home. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, hello, everybody. It's great to see so many people online. 1,000 we have at the moment, um, and the room looks quite, quite full. Um, I saw some familiar names as well. Now, just to help me to get to know you a little bit, uh, you've been telling me where you're from and what time it is where you are. Uh, how many of you have never done online teaching before this period of time. So a lot of teachers have suddenly been thrown into teaching online. How many of you have never ever done any form of online teaching before now? Okay, so quite a lot of you are saying never, me, yep, okay. A lot of you are saying first time, first time teaching, never been taught, never taught online before apart from webinars. Okay, that's fantastic. Oh, some of you can't hear me. Well, um, can I'm assuming most of you can hear me. So uh, if you can't hear me, you probably won't be able to hear me saying put your put your speaker up. Um, okay, good. So some of you can hear me and some of you can hear see me fine. That's good to know. Okay, right. So today, um, I'm gonna have a look at, you know, we are language teachers and ultimately what we do is we teach people to communicate and a lot of us already use the communicative approach in the classroom so i'm not here to talk about methodology today um, but we all know that the communicative approach is about believing that communication and interaction is what helps language learning um, so just very very quickly using the chat field what to you are some of the main features of the communicative approach? What are some of the main features of the communicative approach? So one, I'll give you one example. One is believing that interaction and communication is what helps language learning, right? Learn by doing, learn by using the language. That is interaction. So a lot of people are saying real communication, interaction. Uh, Vasiliki, you say cooperation. Yes, um, a very big part of the, co the communicative approach is working and collaborating with your peers, not just talking to the teacher, but talking to your partner, talking in groups, um, collaborating in peers. Yes, Natalia, you said that too. Working in groups, a lot of people are saying, interacting, fantastic. Um, any other ideas of what the communicative approach might mean? Practicing oral skills, okay? So that sometimes for some of us, it's about conversation, meaningful conversation. One of you wrote meaningful conversation, and that's so true. Another thing about the communicative approach is the belief that it is important for students to negotiate meaning. You know, if I say, oh, where are you from? I'm from Italy. Which part of Italy are you from? I'm from Rome. You've heard those questions a million times. You can answer them quickly. That's not negotiating meaning. There is no struggle involved. The belief is when students struggle to say something, when they're saying, oh, how do I say this? Uh, I um, um, And when they hesitate, when their brain is ticking away, those cogs are ticking away, when that struggle is happening, that's language learning happening right in front of you. It's not saying things that they already know how to say. It's not repeating, you know, where are you from? I'm from Italy. They already know that. Language learning is when those cogs are ticking away and they're figuring out how to say something. And that is what facilitates the learning process. Negotiating meaning. Okay, so someone mentioned information gap. Isabel, you mentioned information gap, and that's exactly one of the things I'll be talking about today. All right, the teacher as facilitator and monitor. So the teacher is not a lecturer. 
The belief is that the teacher is not an information giver or knowledge giver. The teacher is a knowledge facilitator. What do they say? Teach a man, um, give a man a fish and he eats for a day. Teach a man to fish and he eats for a lifetime. And I hope to think that that's our role as teachers. We're teaching our students to gain knowledge, to be teaching them a way of learning the language. We're not giving them the language, but we're facilitating that learning process. So in that nutshell, that's kind of what the communicative approach is about. Now, there's been a lot of criticism about online teaching. A lot of the apps, a lot of the um, tools that we use tend to be very useful for accuracy purposes. Multiple choice, tick the correct answer, correct this, this sentence, find the mistakes. Very minute, discrete item corrections, accuracy focus, grammar focus. Online teaching can be really, really good at that whether you do it synchronously or asynchronously. But how do you get students talking? How do you get them interacting online? That can be quite tricky sometimes. So hopefully we'll get to talk a bit about that and maybe I could give you some ideas as to some of the activities that you already use in your face-to-face -face classes that you could possibly transfer online. Okay. Um, so. Federica very kindly introduced me uh, as a writer and a teacher trainer and a teacher. Uh, I wrote a book called Successful International Communication. And uh, in this book, it's about um, fostering good communication when talking to people across borders, right? Uh, so one of the things I do is I train a lot of corporate clients to communicate internationally. Uh, some of the things I do is uh, I give them sessions and workshops on communicating virtually, like what we're doing now, with virtual teams. Now, before this whole pandemic happened, a lot of um, companies and corporations were already moving towards virtual communication. Uh, a lot of the projects were happening online with teams of people. You might have a team with one person in Peru and another person in Korea and another person in Germany. And that team would come together with their different expertise to work together on a project. But the only way that they can work together and communicate is to have virtual meetings. So one of my jobs is to train corporate clients in communicating successfully in these virtual platforms. And so hopefully I'll be able to transfer some of the tips I have from the corporate sector to the teaching sector. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about mostly today is um, synchronous learning. Can someone give me a, an, a definition of synchronous learning? So sometimes when we talk about online teaching, we talk about synchronous versus asynchronous. So synchronous, you know, thank you very much. Lots of people are saying real, live, same time. Exactly. So right now, you're listening to me talk. If you're not watching a recording of this, you are listening to me talk live. So this is all happening in real time. This is called synchronous learning. So if you use Skype with your students, Zoom with your students, any platform where they can listen to you talk in real time and communicate with you, chat with each other in real time, simultaneous interaction, Isabel says, thank you very much. Or like Monica says on Google Hangouts, for example, this is all happening live and this is called synchronous learning. Now that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Of course, in an asynchronous learning world, you can promote communicative learning too. Uh, for example, you could get students to record something on WhatsApp and send it to the group. You can get all your students to um, watch a television program and give you a summary of it by sending it to a recording of um, the summary to you, uh, for example. And all that would be considered asynchronous learning. But for just for, for the purpose of today's webinar, I'm going to focus on synchronous learning, um, mostly because we want to be looking at the communicative approach and interaction between teacher and student, and more importantly, student and student. 
Yes, absolutely, Linda. You don't need groups for synchronous learning at all. If I'm having a one-to-one -one session with you, that would be a synchronous Skype session, for example, and that would be synchronous learning. Now, looking at the quote in front of you, it says online, online learning. I'm sorry, there's a word missing there. Online learning or online teaching is not the next big thing. It's the now big, now big thing. And this was written before this whole pandemic started. And now we're starting to realize how true that really, really is. So without further ado, let's get started. When you are starting your lesson online, whether you're using Skype or Zoom or whatever platform that you're using, some of you might be using more sophisticated education-based platforms. Um, when you're starting the lesson, what do you do? What do you do at the start of your lesson? Now, I know that when I'm in a face-to-face -face class, Yes, we have greetings. Um, we get to know the students. In fact, in a real class, in a face-to-face -face situation, before the teacher walks into the room, the students often have time to chat with each other. Now, I used to teach in a, an international context. So my students were from different countries. And because they were from different countries, when they chatted to each other, when they made small talk, it's often in English. And then I walk into the room and they're all chatting with each other. Sometimes in an online learning situation, this can be a bit difficult. Students don't <clears throat> engage in small talk in the same way. So that social aspect of trust building, getting to know each other, relationship building is kind of missing out sometimes. Yes, exactly, Tatiana. Chatting, gossiping. Um, if you've got students who already know each other and they get online, they might feel comfortable with each other already and they might be chatting. Oh, how are you doing? How is it being at home, etc. Sometimes if you're at entering a new class, you don't know the students, they don't know each other. It can be even more difficult because people feel a little bit awkward, uncomfortable. They don't know each other. And hey, what's a class if you don't have that relationship with the students? So, yes, exactly like Abdullah says, start with some get to know you activities. Now, I don't have anything hugely fancy. I'm sure you have lots of fancy warmers and get to know you activities. I do something quite simple. I do a one minute check in. So this is a one minute check in. I say, how are you doing? Uh, I I'm fine. My name is Chia. I'm your teacher for today. Um, just to give you a, a, an update about how I'm doing, uh, I've got three children and they are ages one, two, uh, one, four and six. So they're very, very young children. At the moment, they're all at home and I have to homeschool them because all the schools in York, where I live in the UK, um, are closed. And so my, 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 my kids at home and I have to homeschool them, teach them math and English. And to be honest, it's quite difficult when you're trying to do that and you've got a one-year-old screaming for your attention. So I'm finding it really hard to juggle that and then with work as well. So I'm finding myself working in the evenings, in the mornings and any time in the weekends. So that's me. Um, but I'm also positive and I, I appreciate the fact that I have this time to spend time with my children and really get to know their learning and, and what they're doing at school. So that's my situation. How about you? So I've given an example of a quick check-in. I've given an update about myself, my little personal story. And how about you? Um, so then I go through my students, I get them to turn their microphones on one by one, and give us a one minute update about how they are doing. Now, I know that we have 1000 people in the room, so it's gonna be really difficult <laughs> to give each of you one minute. But if you like to, in the chat field, why not give us a couple of sentences to update us on how you are doing? It could be something negative, it could be something positive, but how are you doing? How are you feeling these days? Busier than ever, that's interesting. Teaching from home and very busy, very worried. Okay, I feel you, I feel you. Frustrated, overworked, a lot of work. Yeah, a lot of people think that 
uh, once you work from home, you must be very free. You have lots of time because you're working from home. But ironically, it's not so because if you're working from home, you have a new set of responsibilities, a new set of ways of planning lessons. And if you've never taught online before, I can only imagine that the stress will be uh, quite overwhelming. Too much time at home, okay. Hard to be productive, I understand that. I totally get that, it's very hard to be productive. Good, but worried about money. I feel you and I think a lot of people feel that way. Overwhelmed, busy and worried, frustrated. Thank you so much for sharing. This is really, really means a lot. And um, like Federica said earlier, I'm so pleased that we have the internet because this allows us as a community, as an industry to stand together all of us teachers standing together and, and relating to how each other feels and being able to share that. So this is the one minute check-in that I do sometimes with my children. It's not uh, with, my, with my students, it's not anything fancy, but it gives everyone a chance to do that social chat, that water cooler talk, that small talk in a more formal way. So I say, let's take a minute each to go around and tell us about something new that's been happening in our lives recently. Of course, some of you, um, if you do a very structured lesson at the start of the lesson, you might want to review your objectives. Okay, today's lesson, we're going to be looking at um, some vocabulary to talk about health. Um, we're going to be looking at the present perfect. Okay, we're going to be having some opportunities to practice interacting and talking about the subject. Okay, so you might want to review your objectives and your agenda. And then if it's the first time you're having lessons with this particular group, that very first lesson, you might want to clarify some rules. Well, what do I mean by rules? Okay, here we go. Here are some suggested rules. I'm not saying that you have to have them, but these are my suggested rules. Open and read pre-lesson emails and documents. Now, you might be sending students some documents. If you're doing an information gap activity, if you're doing an information gap activity, you might be sending some of the students different materials, different pictures, whatever the activity is. You need them to make sure that they open it before the lesson, okay? So encourage them to open and read pre-lesson emails and documents. Of course, don't overwhelm them with too many documents. The last thing a student needs right now is to open and realize that they have to read a 20 page document before a lesson. So we don't want that. But if it's a simple email, if it's a one page document, make sure they read it. When you're asking questions, perhaps a teacher needs to moderate and facilitate even more in an online situation. So nominate, right? You can say, okay, Sarah, you answer this question. All right, uh, Bernie, you answer this question. Anil, you answer the next question. Okay. Um, if you are all with your microphone switched on, I'm sure you know what it's like on Skype or on Zoom when everyone is interrupting each other, when you have a big class, it can be quite difficult to hear because the sound gets lost intermittently. So avoid interrupting. I would even get go as far as to say, if you need to laugh, do a silent laugh. My daughter, my four-year-old daughter, has been taught this thing called the silent cheer. So if I say, oh, what, what's a silent cheer? She does this. She goes, that's a silent cheer. Practice a silent laugh. Why am I asking you to practice a silent laugh? Why can't you laugh when you're online? Because when you laugh, this microphone picks up the sound and it shifts its focus to the person laughing instead of the person talking. So then the person talking would have gaps in between their speech, their monologue, because the microphone doesn't know what to focus on because people are laughing. So get your students to practice a silent laugh. You still know they're laughing. If you can see the camera, you can see them smiling, you can see them laughing. If you can't see the camera, get them to type smiley faces, laughing faces in the, in the chat field or LOL, laugh out loud. Yes, exactly. You can use emojis, Barbara says. But try not to laugh into the microphone so that you don't interrupt the entire process. All right, next, next rule is speak clearly. Now, this is obvious. You're in a language class. Of course, you want people to speak clearly. But online, it's even more important 
that people communicate and speak clearly. And if necessary, to slow down. I know I should talk. I'm one of the fastest speakers you probably know, but it's really important to remind students, slow down, speak clearly. Yes, you can laugh at me now. <laughs> Now, the other thing I have here is ask for clarification if you don't understand, sure, you know, um, if you don't understand an instruction, if you don't understand a teacher. In a face-to-face -face class, you might pretend that you understand and you just carry on with your group work. In an online situation, it is crucial, even more than a face-to-face -face situation, that you actually understand. So do encourage students to clarify, ask questions and remind them there's no such thing as a stupid question. All right, so the other thing that intimidates a lot of people is silence. So you're trying to get people communicating, you're trying to get people talking and interacting because you're all about the communicative approach. And then you get silence. And if you're used to a face-to-face -face face -face situation, a class where students are talking, the atmosphere is dynamic, everyone is chatting in the pairs, in their groups, suddenly having silence online can be really, really frightening. Like right now, I know the chat feel is going, but when I tell a joke and people don't laugh and I'm used to a class full of people laughing, it can feel really strange and it makes me a little bit insecure. Like Angela says, a little bit disconcerting. Don't worry. It's probably not you. Now, here are some reasons why people are silent in an online situation. Maybe they're distracted. They might be multitasking, okay? They might be vacuuming the floor, making a cup of tea, <laughs> answering an email during the lesson, and you don't want that. So one way to avoid multitasking is get them all to turn on their videos, if that is possible. Okay, get them to turn their videos on or get them to turn the mics on. If you can't do video, mics, get all the mics to be on so that they are less likely to multitask because you they, they know you can see them. <laughs> maybe they're confused and they're keeping quiet about it because maybe they're a bit embarrassed about, you know, what's happening and they, they're embarrassed that they don't understand you. Maybe they're just not interested. You're talking about cars and motorcycles and they're like not interested in this topic but they don't want to tell you that so they go silent sometimes they're silent because you've gone off the agenda you know they were expecting you to be talking about a and you're talking about b and they think mm, don't know not very relevant to me they've gone quiet maybe they're bored Maybe they don't understand, but they're just letting it pass. They're, just, they're not asking for clarification for whatever reason. They're not asking for clarification. They're just going to let it pass. Maybe they disagree. Maybe it's a controversial topic and they disagree, but they don't want to start an argument. They don't like conflict, so they're letting it pass. Or maybe they do agree. They just have nothing else to say. There's nothing to add, so... Maybe they're silent because um, in their mind, what you've said is not wrong. So I have nothing to correct. Because some people only say something when there's something to correct, right? Yes, um, Lydia, you're absolutely right. They may be shy. That could be one of the reasons. Maybe they're silent and someone already said this in the chat field, they need time to think or uh, like Kanika says, they might be making notes. Or maybe some people are just not com comfortable with spontaneity. They might not be very confident like Joyce says, they just perhaps prefer to be able to prepare things beforehand, to pre prepare sentences they need to say beforehand. Maybe they don't feel comfortable saying all this in front of the whole class but they might be a bit more comfortable doing this as a pair. And this is where breakout rooms come in. Now in the chat field, just very quickly, how many of you are using breakout rooms? If you are using breakout rooms in your online teaching, please type yes. If you're not, please type no. 
So what are breakout rooms? Breakout rooms are a chance for you to let students do pair work and group work by saying, okay, go to this room with your partner and do the exercise. They are brilliant. Zoom has them. So if you're using Zoom, and I believe Zoom is now free to use up to 40 minutes, am I right? So if you're using Zoom up to 40 minutes, you can use their breakout rooms and you allow them to um, go to a room with a partner or a group of three or four and do an activity, whether it's a task-based learning activity or a controlled practice activity. Um, it's fantastic. And it allows you, if you're doing a group class, not a one-to-one, -one, but it, uh, yeah, Julian, it's, uh, it's kind of like a private room, but the teacher can monitor. So you can go into the room and check out what they're doing. So you might have a few breakout rooms and you might be able to go to the individual rooms and check out how each pair or each group is doing. Um, do have a you know try it out i can talk about it but perhaps best way is to just try it out go on zoom um try it out yes julian you can't see the other group they're they're alone with their activity it's great um I'll, I'll give you a few ideas for activities that you can use in these kind of breakout rooms okay uh julia i'm not sure if it exists on ms microsoft teams as well it very well could do i've asked around and um, the consensus seems to be that Zoom has uh, the most useful platform when you're using, if you're going to use breakout rooms. Okay, so knowing that these are the, all the possible answers to why people are being silent, perhaps you will feel less insecure and you will feel like it's less about you. It's not you. It could possibly be a variety of reasons why they are silent. So don't take it too hard. <laughs> so multitasking was one of the issues that we mentioned earlier. So yes, Ruth, absolutely. You can make the groups. So you make the groups, you say, you could do it randomly or you could assign, you could say, okay, Andrea, Ruth, Jacqueline, three of you, you go to room number, blah, blah, blah. And Mary, Natalia, you go to this other room. Okay. So yes, Mary, uh, some of the activities I'll be talking about today can be used in breakout rooms too. So here are some quick ideas as to how to avoid multitasking. Uh, I've already mentioned some of them. Use the video, get them to turn their microphone on and give people different tasks. Okay. And rotate these tasks. Now, this is what I tell this, this, is the, this is the tips that I tell my corporate clients. I'm not telling you to do this, but um, this is what I tell my corporate clients. I get, you know, when they have virtual meetings, like business meetings, I say, okay, well, someone keep the minutes, someone you track the action items, and someone come up with a question at the end. And when people have a task, they are much more likely to pay attention. Now, how can we transfer this knowledge from the business context into our teaching context? Now, one way to do this is uh, to use Edward de Bono's six hats. Have you ever heard of Edward de Bono's six hats? If you have, give a loud yes in the chat field. Okay, quite a few of you have heard of it. Some of you haven't. So Edward de Bono, do Google uh, search this. He has this idea that if you give each person a different role in a discussion, it could be a debate, it could be a discussion, it could be a brainstorming session, give each student a different hat to wear. So for example, okay, I've got Dolora, okay, Dolora Romero, you're gonna wear the blue hat. And the blue hat says it's about thinking, okay? Your, your specialty, your role, it's like a game this, uh, your role is to think about thinking. Organize the thinking. Your role is planning. You're good at planning. So, okay, that's your role, Dolora. Um, Alexandra, your role is the green hat and you're going to wear the green hat and you're going to be all about creativity. You're going to come up with new ideas, new solutions, possibilities, alternatives. You see the world as full of opportunities. So, Beatrix, I know you like the green hat, but because I know you like the green hat, I'm going to make you wear the black hat today which is the opposite of a blean, the green hat. The black hat is the person who is always worried about difficulties, weaknesses. But we need black hats because, you know, if everyone's positive, then we're just going to miss all the risks and problems, won't we? So we do need a black hat in the group. 
it's not a bad thing. So Beatrix Price, you're going to be the black hat and you're going to tell us about difficulties and weaknesses and dangers and, and give us logical reasons. Don't just be negative for the sake of being negative. You're going to be, ne you're going to be negative with good reason. Right now, uh, I've got um, Marissa. She says white hat, please. But because she wants the white hat, I'm going to give her the red hat <laughs> because I'm kind of evil that way. So Marissa, you're going to wear the red hat and you're going to be all about feelings. When we are talking, you're going to be talking about how this makes you feel, your intuitions, your emotions, your hunches, etc., etc. So as you can see, each student would be given a different hat to wear and a different role to play. So when you have a group discussion, now you could do this in a breakout room with a group of, I don't know, four, six people, or you can do this in as a whole class in a group class discussion. Giving them different hats to wear ensures that they pay attention because they have a role. Masha. You say, how do you feel watched by a thousand people? Um, I'm very, very honoured that you're all here to, with me today to talk to me. But I see this more as a session for us to share ideas and more importantly, to share our feelings because I know this is a very hard time for a lot of you. And many of you have shared earlier that you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, overly busy and overworked. And I'm hoping in a way that this webinar is a chance for you to share those feelings and know that you're part of a, a larger community who shares your feelings. Another thing I tell my corporate clients to do in their virtual teams in business is to assign a Yoda. Any Star Wars fans out there? Now, what is Yoda like? <laughs> what, is, what are some typical features of a Yoda? Okay, aside from the fact that he's old. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, critical thinking, bad grammar. <laughs> okay, not the bad grammar bit. He's wise. <laughs> he speaks in the, with words in the wrong order. He's handsome. Nice one. Thank you. So this is what a Yoda in my classroom does. The Yoda's job is to monitor everyone. He's like the wise guy who watches over everyone. Now, usually, this is the job of a teacher. But having a Yoda gives you kind of an assistant. And in a virtual situation, you really need someone to back you up, you know, like a, a right-hand man. This person ensures the discussion is on topic. And if it's not on topic, yeah, like a class monitor. Thank you, Vivek. Like a class monitor. <laughs> Call out inappropriate behaviors like a class monitor. Well done for spotting that. Spot misunderstandings. Now, this is really important, right? Earlier, we say it's really important to clarify. Some people don't understand and they pretend they understand. You don't want that. So if things are not clear, if the teacher is at fault for giving unclear instructions, the Yoda's job is to say, teacher, I'm not sure if that was very clear. Can you give us an example? All right. So the Yoda can call out the teacher as well and say, oh, that instruction not so clear miss can you please clarify give an instruction give a give a give an example i mean yes yes there are a lot of yodas in the class sometimes so appoint one yoda say okay okay uh, anna you're going to be the yoda today and then tomorrow someone else is going to be a yoda so rotate the yoda so that everyone has a chance to be the teacher's you know right hand man it's a fun role, isn't it? It is. It really is. Sometimes if you're in a grown-up class and you're discussing something quite controversial and everyone's being polite, everyone's kind of going around the topic, no one's talking about that big elephant in the room, the Yoda's job is to point that out and to say, is nobody actually talking about this? It's a bit negative, but it's important that we talk about it. In a business meeting, this is really important. In a business situation, it's really important that you cover all bases and talk about even the things that people don't want to talk about. And I feel like sometimes in the classroom, it's kind of true too, especially if you're teaching grown-ups. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about happy, fun stuff like, you know, traveling and going to beaches and what are your hobbies and your likes and your dislikes and wonderful food around the world. Sometimes it's important to have someone call out stuff that are a bit more controversial, 
topics that are maybe a little bit more difficult to talk about. All right, so at the start of this webinar, I said that this is all about you and what you already are doing in your normal classroom. So in a face-to-face -face classroom, these are some activities that you already do. I just want to remind you of them and tell you how wonderful these activities are for online teaching. So hopefully you'll remember to use them when you're teaching online too. Now let's start with control practice, right? Now, if you're using a breakout room, this is easy to do. You send a pair of students each to a breakout room and you get them to do control practice. So let's have a look at the first dialogue on this page. It says, which do you prefer, coffee or tea? I prefer coffee. What about you? I prefer tea. Very controlled dialogue you're getting them to do. For To do this dialogue, they need to turn on their microphones. So you want them in a breakout room, in pairs, practicing very controlled dialogues. Okay, so in the first one, you're practicing the use of prefer, I prefer. All right, so very elementary stuff. Uh, in the second one, have you ever been to Peru? No, I haven't. Have you? Yes, I have. It's beautiful. Here we're looking at a grammatical control practice of the present perfect with the word ever. Again, something that you do already. You can do it online too. Put them in a room and get them to do it. And sometimes, you know, the best way to get students talking is to make them feel confident. And when you give them something so controlled like this, yeah, it's kind of like drilling, isn't it, Christopher? Almost. With a little bit of freedom. Drilling with a bit of freedom. But when you start small, controlled, it gives them a bit of confidence because, you know, we teachers are feeling the pressure of teaching online. We are feeling the pressure of this new technology. And so are the students. The students feel it too. So start small. Give them something really safe, like control practice. It's really safe. And then you can build from there. Right. So what if you don't have breakout rooms? Um, so if you don't have breakout rooms, then obviously you do it in a full class situation. I have done it, um, including role plays. I've got certain students to turn on their mics, so I might nominate. If you have everybody with their mics on already, that's okay. If their mics are not on, you nominate them. You say, Angela and Julian, both, turn your mics on, please. And then, okay, can you do this dialogue, Angela and Julian? Okay, next pair, next pair. So you can nominate people choose them and say, okay, you do this, you do this. Not ideal because it takes up a lot of time. And that's why breakout rooms are quite good to use if you do have them. So when you're doing control practice, some of you already know the sequence, initiate, response, feedback. That's what you want them to do, right? Initiate. Have you ever been to Peru? Response. No, I haven't. Have you? Yes, I have. It's beautiful. Feedback. All right, so remember this sequence when you're getting them to do control practice. Sunita, so explain breakout room. Uh, a breakout room is like a separate room. So we're talking right now on a webinar. Imagine if I took you, Sunita, and Mohammed, I say both of you go to room number one and I open a little private room and you can go into that room, just the two of you, and have a practice with each other and nobody else can hear you. If I, the teacher, choose to drop into the breakout room, I can come in to monitor and give further instructions, right? So a breakout room is really like putting students in pairs or in groups, but they can't hear each other. Um, again, for those who missed it, Zoom is doing um, 40, if, you, if your lesson is less than 40 minutes, you can use Zoom for free. And on Zoom, they have breakout rooms. So if you wanna try that, you know, give Zoom a try. Now, other things you can do in an online teaching situation, task-based learning can be fantastic, right? Um, now, there are many types of task-based learning. Let's start with listing and brainstorming. Things you need in a lockdown. Go, guys, using the chat field because there are a thousand people, so I can't really have your microphones on, but we'll use the chat field. Things you need in a lockdown. Go. Patience, I like that one. <laughs> Snacks. Laptop, okay. Yes, broadband, definitely. Dumbbells, someone's being very active, very, very active. 
Um, toilet roll. I see a lot of toilet rolls coming up. That's brilliant. Netflix. Yes. Positive approach. Good one. Professional development. That's why you're here. Fantastic. Board games. I've got loads of those and I love my board games. Mindfulness. Some really good answers there. Fantastic, you guys. Now, some of you might be thinking, should we be talking about coronavirus? Should we be talking about the pandemic? Um, sensitive topic, maybe a bit of a taboo. Hey, look, we want to talk about it. It's happening to our lives. We are living in some mad, mad times. It's real to us and it's affecting our lives. So you know your students. If you think your students don't want to be talking about it, that's fine. But don't go out of your way to avoid it because, hey, we need to share our feelings as well. So a, a, a lighthearted way to do this is by getting them to list things you need in a lockdown, like what you're doing now. Or aside, you could say things we can do in a virtual classroom, get your students to tell you. Uh, or bucket list ideas. I think one of you was asking me, what is bucket list ideas? A bucket list is a list of things you want to do before you die. So on my bucket list, I have things like live in Italy for a month. That's one of the things I want to do before I, I, I die. Uh, go and climb and see the Machu Picchu. That's another thing that I want to do. So yeah, things I want to do before I die. Why is it called a bucket list? Because Rebecca Tomlinson says here, the expression to kick the bucket means to die. Not a very nice expression. And that's where it comes from. Bucket list. Because you before you kick the bucket, before you die. <laughs> okay. Mohammed, Italy is dangerous these days, but I'm sure we'll all recover from it. And, you know, I will fulfill my bucket list uh, dream of living in Italy for a couple of months before I die, hopefully. Um, and I'm sure you've got lots of other brainstorming activities that you already use or can use. And this can be an easy way to start a lesson. Everyone with a little idea, everyone can contribute easily. Another task-based learning activity you could do is a sorting, ranking one. Like, you know, what are some of the most important stories in the world, in history? Okay, what are the 10 most important stories in the chat field? Any ideas? 10 most important stories. It can be real fiction or non-fiction, okay? So, all right. Biblical story, some of you are saying. Titanic, interesting. Harry Potter, yeah, nice. See, I think Romeo and Juliet, um, because Cinderella, interesting, yeah. <laughs> War and Peace, oh, very, very serious there. Yes, uh, I can never get through that book. Twilight. So you get your students, you can do it in the breakout room in groups or you can do it as a whole class if you really want to. But this could work really well in the breakout room with a small group decide on your top 10 most important stories okay uh, any other kind of sorting ranking activities like um what is the criteria of a good job lots of holidays high pay interesting work good colleagues um free gym membership <laughs> free things to bring home what are the what is the criteria of a good job get them to rank it in order top most important, down second most important, third most important, and get them to agree on it. So this is a nice little task to do. This third one is something that we've always done in ELT, desert island essentials, right? If you are trapped on a desert, what would you need? This is kind of similar to what you need on lockdown, but you have to pick 10 items. You can only carry 10 items to a desert island. What would they be? Uh, twist on that topic. What are your top 10 desert island movies that you will bring onto the desert island? Top 10 songs, albums, books, etc. Top 10 things to put in a time capsule that will be opened in 100 years from now. Top 10 technology trends in the three, last three years. Get them to sort it, get them to present it to the class. Comparing is another task-based learning activity that I often do. Um, now, if you know this, it is Edward Hopper, the artist, Edward Hopper's um, Nighthawks. Uh, some of you attended my previous webinar about using images and you've seen this picture, but um, 
recently I brought this picture back because recently I read an article about how Edward Hopper is the artist of social distancing. Because if you notice, the people in his pictures tend to sit very far apart. Are they? Do you think they're at least two meters apart from each other? So that's the, there you go. Edward Hopper's social distancing in practice. <laughs> No, you don't think they're two meters apart. Well, the, the man and the woman are clearly from the same family. Yeah, the, the couple is from the same family. So I think they're, they're, they're okay. Um, but the other man with the hat from on the other side, I think he, he is definitely practicing good social distancing there. <laughs> now, if you get on the internet online, you will find lots of varieties of this very same picture. You can see one example that I've shown you, but if you just type Nighthawk parody, on to Google search, you will find lots and lots of varieties of this picture. So if you're worried online, oh, you know, I can't photocopy things for an information gap activity, use these things online, use parodies of artwork, right? So student A, so you send student A quietly by email, you send student A the first picture, you send student B the second picture, and then you get them in a breakout room to do an information gap activity. They have to tell each other about the painting they see. They don't know anything about the other person's painting. They only know about theirs. So they have to. Yes, Teodora, thank you very much. On Zoom, you don't have to use emails even. You can send those files privately on Zoom itself. That's totally possible. Or you can email it to the students. They look at the picture and they have to describe it to each other. They have to find the difference, right? Now, I was having a chat with Beatrix Price the other day um, about her online classes. And she said something fantastic. She said, you know, some of these activities work even better online than face to face. And I think information gap is one of those things that really work really well. Do you know why? Because in a face to face situation, how many of you have had students that simply just look, they just look at their partner's paper, oh, let me have a look. And that's the end of your activity, right? They've just looked at each other's pictures. <laughs> but online, they can't look at each other's pictures, can they? Because they're in two completely different locations. So they can't just say, oh, let me see your picture. Well, they can show it to the camera, but that's, that's, that defeats the whole purpose. So information gap activities can actually work even better online than face-to-face. -face. Now, we have um, critical incidents. Now, I use critical incidents a lot in my communication skills training. Now, earlier I said that uh, one of the things I do is I teach um, corporations how to communicate internationally. So I do a lot of intercultural communication skills and um, virtual skills, that sort of thing. Um, and I use things like this. Have a look. Soon after I met Salim, I said I was going to the conference hall and he said he would come with me. He then held my hand and started walking. I didn't know what to do, so I let him hold my hand until I've arrived at the conference hall, but it felt very strange. What's happening to Jeff here? Can someone in the chat feel just very quickly tell me what is the issue here? What's the problem ha that, that's happening? Yes, cultural shock is very, very true. That is a culture I issue here. And what is the difference in the two cultures? Exactly. So, Barbara, you say two men holding hands and that is <laughs> social distance is the issue. Karen, very nice. <laughs> In this day and age, it's, uh, the, the issue is social distance. That's the whole problem, isn't it? Um, yes. So, for some cultures, holding hands, two men holding hands are totally normal. It's a way of showing friendship. If you don't believe me, get on Google search and just type George Bush, President George Bush, holding hands, and you will find lots of wonderful pictures of George Bush holding hands with the king of Saudi Arabia. It is a totally normal, friendly, relationship-building gesture in some countries, but to others who don't know about this, this might feel very, very awkward. Now, this is what I call, or what cultural uh, intercultural trainers call a critical incident. A critical incident is where you have a situation where there's a bit of a problem Maybe it's a communication problem or an intercultural issue. And your job is to solve this problem. So, you know, I, th these, the, the, your job is 
I've got this WWYD here. You see that? WWYD? What does that stand for? WWYD. Any ideas? Thank you very much. Oh, you're all really good. What would you do? What would you do tasks are fantastic? Whether it's online or face to face, when you ask someone what would you do, they feel comfortable answering because they know that they're not being themselves. They're pretending to be someone else. They're pretending to be Jeff. They're pretending to be Salim. So it's safe. I'm not revealing too much of myself. But in a critical incident, it's often a little bit controversial. There's a problem to solve, something to do. And it gives students a chance to, a, a motivation to get engaged and to communicate. If you just say, hey, tell us about your last holiday, there is no real motivation for me to communicate that to you. But if I'm given a problem, a controversial issue, and I'm asked, what would you do? I would feel more motivated to give my opinions about it. And yes, Angelica, to give my own point of view and to share that different points of view in the class. Here's another example of a critical incident. I'm not going to read it for you. You can read it yourself. What's the problem here? So this is something that um, I have in my book and um, I've used it in training sessions uh, online. And uh, it's been really interesting because I had I have people saying what you say, which is all oh, too personal. There's like an interrogation. There's no personal space. All these personal questions like an inquiry. And then I've had other students from a different culture say, oh, it's really clear that Ben is about to give Leon a promotion. So I was taken aback. All the students were like, what? So from certain cultures point of view, that's how a manager gets to know someone. Ben is the manager and Leon is the employee. And Ben is interested in developing the employee. That's how some people saw it. So clearly for some cultures, they say, oh, invasion of privacy. And for some cultures, it's like, oh, it's clear that Ben really likes Leon. This is fantastic. So it's all about different points of view. Thank you, Julian. Ben is a police officer. <laughs> or you could give them some real world task, like, you know, create a newsletter, carry out a survey. You know, you have got Doodle and all these kind of uh, survey making tools online. Get them to create a survey, carry it, out, carry it out, prepare a presentation and get them to give a webinar to the class. Get them to make a video together. Get them to plan a virtual Skype party. You know this, this activity. Say something about yourself, three sentences. Which one is true and which one is false? If I told you that one of these sentences are false, which one would it be? Any ideas? Which one would it be? I used to be a judo champion. I used to be an actress. I used to have a shaved head. Which one is the false one? Interesting. So I was never a judo champion. That is the false one. I was never a judo champion, but I did have a shaved head. Here's a picture of myself with a shaved head. <laughs> um, and that brings me on to the next topic. Use photos. Use real life photos. That helps students to engage with you. It gets, gets, gets yourself. You don't, you don't have to show a photo as controversial as this one, but sometimes showing a photo of yourself. This is me as a child with my family. It's a great way of breaking down barriers, breaking down the ice, and getting people to do the same. Get your students to share photos of what they're doing at home, of photos on their phones, etc. Now, we talked a lot about information gap. There are quite a lot of types of information gap you can be doing. You can get students to spot the difference, like I told you earlier. Yeah, spot the difference. You can get them to complete a text. So each student has a different text and they have to complete it. You can get them to describe a video. So one student has a video, you send them the link to a YouTube video. The other one doesn't know what the video is. So student A has to describe it to student B. And student B has to try and imagine the video. Or this is an idea that I have always been using in my face-to-face -face classes. And I saw um, Beatrix, Beatrix Price use this. And she's allowed me to show you what 
she her students did last week. So this is what her students did last week in a breakout room as part of her Zoom class. Okay, so she gave student A this picture. She asked student B to draw the picture, but student A had to describe it to student B. So this is what student B came up with. So this is a picture dictation. Student A describes it, student B draws the picture. Isn't this fantastic? So thank you very much, Beatrix and students, for allowing me to um, show everyone these wonderful pictures here. So much fun. I love a good picture dictation. And it's not about how well you can draw. I can't draw. I draw stick people all the time. But it's a nice, fun activity. Class debates, always good. Yeah. Here are some sentences. Maybe you can get students to debate it. Parents should not try and homeschool their children. Okay, group A says yes. Group B says no. Go for it. Working from home is better than working in an office. Yes or no, etc. Use the news, right? The news is what we watch all the time. The Guardian newspaper in the UK have a website called Best Photographs of the Day. And they have these wonderful photos of the news every day that you can pick and use with your students. This is something I picked from a couple of days ago. If you, and, and you get students to guess, right? Where is this? Anybody knows? Where is this? Um, and what is it about? So students guess. They try to give a caption to it. Um, not Italy, but yes, Switzerland. Isn't they're fantastic. This is the Matterhorn um, mountain. The, the, the Matterhorn is the highest peak in Switzerland, I believe. And there is an artist who's created a piece of art using light projections. And if you can see in this picture, the red light in the middle says, stay at home, hashtag stay at home. And there's a few variations of it. One says hope. Another one says stay at home. Very on topic, but very positive. Something that you could use, get students to describe the photos, talk about the photos. Okay, guess the headline. Here is an, a, a piece of news from the BBC. What do you think this headline might be? Get students to guess the headline. As you can imagine, here is uh, how uh, supermarkets managing social distancing. Here we can get students to talk about, uh, if you see the yellow lines on the floor, that's, that's the whole social distance thing. The yellow lines represent two meters. Uh huh. So a chance for students to talk about their experiences at the supermarkets, people overbuying, panic buying, buying toilet paper. Um, and, you know, images are always great to use, even online, right? Get students to finish a comic strip, guess the title. Um, Use pictures from course books like this one is from Language Hub and Upper Intermediate, a photo from the course book, you know, present it to students, get them to caption it, get them to go online and find a quote that matches it. There are no right or wrong answers. Give me a quote that you think describes this picture. And the, the book, this is the one from the book. The quote is, the true mystery of the world is the invisible the, the visible, not the invisible. This is so interesting. Compare and contrast. Again, use photographs from the course book. This is also from Language Hub. Get photos from the course book. Get students to do a lot of description. Compare, contrast. Get them to do scripts. Get them to write a script. So you've got four pictures of a storyline. If you're using breakout rooms, you can get them to do it in groups. Write the script and then perform it. Now, I just wanted to end this webinar by with this quote. E-learning doesn't just happen. It requires careful planning and implementation. Now, I say this with irony. Why irony? Because we don't have careful planning and implementation. We didn't just spend half a year planning an e-learning program. No, this is not my quote, Muhammad. I got it on the internet, and it is an actual quote about e-learning. But we are in a special situation. We were thrown into e-learning. It just happened for us. So this quote does not apply to any of us because we didn't have the time to carefully plan and implement anything. So stop worrying and enjoy learning through this experience. When I was learning to drive, 
I was very, very stressed because I only started learning to drive when I was 40 years old. And I got very stressed. And my husband said to me, um, enjoy the fact that you're learning something from scratch, that you're learning something new, because how many times do we get to do something like that at this age? And I thought that is such a good, positive way of looking at it. For many of us who have never taught online and who have never done any e-learning or online teaching, this is all very scary. But this is also a new learning experience for our professional development, something that we can take with us even after this pandemic is over, something that we can continue doing that will enrich our professional lives. So enjoy that learning. And don't forget, everything you've been doing in your face-to-face -face lessons, you can do it too in your online classes. You don't need fancy technology and apps. You just need your ideas and what you've always known how to do. Thank you.